Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. Just last week, a teacher in Florida was fired for claiming that Holocaust denial, the fact that the Holocaust never happened, is an actual valid historical theory, which really, to me, begs the question, how do we remember what happened during the Holocaust? How do we remember come to terms with, memorialize what happened, and understand it in ways that are relevant to today. So my guest is somebody very well-versed in this, Mary Fulbrook. Uh, she is the uh, professor, a professor of German history at University College in London, and the author of a new and fascinating and important book called Reckonings, Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice. We cover all of that in a way that I know that you will be fascinated and find relevant today. Uh, this isn't ancient history. This is present history. Uh, questions of justice, of remembering and memory, of making what happened uh, during the Holocaust relevant to what is going on in our society, in our politics uh, today. Uh, stay tuned for a truly fascinating conversation with Mary Fulbrook. Uh, just last week, a high school uh, principal in Florida declared that he couldn't say for sure that the Holocaust was actually a factual historical event and lost his job, lost his teaching job uh, in the Florida school uh, where he was teaching. Uh, this is pretty shocking uh, to those of us who have uh, paid very close attention to the Holocaust and have studied the Holocaust, uh, as I did and as my guest today did uh, in her new book called Reckonings. My guest, Mary Fulbrook, a professor of German history at the University College London uh, and the author of numerous books, uh, as well as her current book, on a, a prize-winning book subtitled Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice. So first of all, Mary, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, Holocaust denial is, is something uh, that... Uh, we run up against uh, here and there in American culture. And I know it's been something that uh, has at times been an issue in uh, the UK and, and indeed all across Europe. Uh, we see a rise in hate crimes in this country and in Europe against Jews. And so I think a discussion about the Holocaust and uh, the last many decades of coming to terms with the Holocaust is always relevant, and it's it's certainly relevant today. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to this topic, uh, how you came to write this book. Um, it's one of those answers which both explains it and doesn't explain it, because the family background is the same for my brother and he became a research chemist so family background could take you into chemistry rather than history but yeah. I grew up with an incredibly ambivalent feeling about Germany my mother was a refugee from Nazi Germany she got out in the 1930s and went to Britain and my father was in fact a Canadian and had nothing whatsoever to do with the Holocaust but I grew up never not knowing about the incredibly awful things that had happened in Nazi Germany. And yet at the same time, my mother was always desperate to go back, to pick up old school friendships, to go back to what she still saw as her homeland. Um, mm -hmm. And so we spent family summer holidays in Germany. And so for me as a child, it was the loveliest place on earth, as well as the most evil place on earth, because mm. family summer holidays are what they are. You enjoy them as a child. And so I guess I grew up with this incredibly ambivalent set of feelings and needed as an adult to try and explore what really uh, Germany was about and where things had come from. And I spent many decades not looking at Nazism at all, exploring every other aspect of German history, really just circling around it mm -hmm. until finally I couldn't avoid it and, and had to get into it. 
and what's and what specifically then well tell it what what is the i guess the the thesis of your book reckonings i mean that's an uh, that's an obviously very telling and powerful title so what what was the uh, specific motivation for the way you approached this part of german history this part of european history and 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 really a part of all of our history. What was the what was the specific driver for this approach? I, I guess there's several things there. One is the sense that it has been so pervasive. It's been such an important period in history that has affected not only the people who lived through that period, but those who've come afterwards, the second generation, not only the children of survivors, but the children of perpetrators and people just all over the place who look back on that and think, how could this this have happened? How could it come about? How could it not have been stopped? So I, I wanted to understand this all pervasive influence it's had on subsequent generations as well as those who lived through it. And I wanted to understand that from a variety of different perspectives, different communities, um, not only the obvious ones, children of Jewish survivors from camps and, and death marches and so on, but children of SS officers, children mm -hmm. of policemen, and also the groups who weren't really so much in the public attention, gay men, Zinti and Roma, and other marginalized groups. So that was one real driving force where I felt that we're, we're actually not learning about a past that is history. We're trying to understand also how that has affected who we are, why we think the ways in which we do and do the things we do. That was one part of it. Mm -hmm. The other part was an incredible sense of injustice. The more I explored the failure of the post-war states to bring Nazi war criminals to court, um, to prosecute and really... Um, meet out adequate justice for their crimes and the more i explored how few victims gained what could be in any way considered even approaching adequate compensation for what they had lost and suffered uh, the more i was bothered by it and i think in working through those things i also realized something that i'd never really considered before which is that the remembrance of victims, the almost obsessive memorialization of victims in which we've been engaging over the last two, three decades particularly, really has gone along with a cover-up of the failure to prosecute those who are responsible. And so I, I guess the book emerged out of those different strands of engagement with that past. Yeah, and um, and you and I t t talked about this a little bit via email as we were setting up this this call. I mean, I I too have had long an interest in this from a from a a very different perspective, and and actually wrote a book. It was m kind of my last uh, big project as a journalist before I went to law school, and I I wrote about a particular SS officer. Uh, who operated in a part of Poland that, that you also cover in your book. And the ideas that I explored, I find uh, a lot of uh, overlap, actually, in, in, in the way you approached your uh, discussion and exploration, both in terms of the, the, the legal issues, the, the questions of justice and injustice, the inadequacy of the prosecution actually which probably runs counter to what most people think about because in in our historical imagination we think about the nuremberg trials we think about germany itself being quote brought to justice uh but but beyond the 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 legal uh dimensions of the coming to terms with the holocaust there are so many political geopolitical social, cultural uh, questions that, uh, of how we have come to terms with what happened. And, and I think as you're, you approach those questions, there are clear differences when you look at each generation that has had to, had to deal with this history. Um, d t tell us a little bit about what you found as you explored those issues in terms of how different generations uh, 
have uh because we're really at almost the third generation now since since the actual event there were the perpetrators and the survivors there were the children of those perpetrators and the children of those survivors and now we're kind of in a place where we're we're really one more generation removed from the direct experience of living through it what 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 are some of the things that you found relevant about how each generation has has struggled to come to terms with what happened well i think there's a very interesting intersection of generation and geopolitical location in terms of dealing with the past um the first thing to be said is while the big nazis were still alive and fit to stand trial that generation particularly in west germany and austria was not willing to bring them to trial in the ways in which they should have done so i think when we're just looking at the legal side of that story we have a story in the 50s 60s 70s of a few key prominent trials that are very obvious but an enormous hidden number of acquittals or failures to bring to court or mm -hmm. um, lenient justice and short sentences being meted out particularly in west germany which wrongly in my view has got a very good reputation for facing up to the past i think that reputation is earned only because of the public sphere, the controversies, the open debates that West Germans had in the public sphere, but it was not earned in the courtroom where Nazis just got off the hook very, very easily. And I think that was in part because the generation of judges in West German courts were themselves, many of them former Nazis or were influenced mm -hmm. by having lived through that period and were very much more sympathetic very often to the defendants than they were to the witnesses. So I think there's a whole story there that needs much more uncovering and unpacking. Um, a rather different version of that in Austria, where it was the juries who tended to acquit very obvious Nazis. The situation is quite different in East Germany, mm -hmm. where they wanted to be more visibly severe by and large. So there's a, there's a big comparative story. I won't go into the details yeah, on that. Yeah. But I think if we look at what happens in the wider sphere, then the, the generational issues the coming to maturity in the late 70s and 80s of a younger generation meant that people were much more interested in exploring what these experiences meant for both perpetrators and victims. And I think it's um, an interesting shift, the late 70s, 80s, there's an interesting shift into under, wanting to understand what it meant to be a survivor, the whole notion of being a survivor, the impact on a person's whole life. People are no longer treated just as a, a witness in court. It's very often, the previous era is very often called the era of the witness. But in fact, the era of the survivor really only comes when a younger generation wants to explore across um, community boundaries to understand what it meant to have been persecuted, what everyday life felt like. And I think what you get is, particularly among West Germans and not so much among East Germans, among the second generation, there is this incredible burden of a feeling of guilt. They're not actually guilty, but no. they've been brought to feel responsible for what their parental generation had done and to feel ashamed of guilt being and German. shame. Yeah. And that sense yeah. of shame among younger West Germans is enormous. And I think that plays a big role in the explosion of remembrance, memorialization, the building of memorials and the laying of the little stumbling stones, Stolpersteiner and so on. That's an enormous impetus in the 1990s and onwards. You don't get that same sense of shame among East Germans, interestingly, because the East German official myth had been that they were the anti-fascist state, that the people yeah. were effectively innocent, that it was just the, the big fascists, the monopoly capitalists, the imperialists and so on, who had been responsible and not the people. So younger East Germans are brought up almost to feel that they had been fighting with the Red Army. They had more pride or were supposed to feel more pride. In any event, they didn't feel this incredible legacy of guilt and shame. And I think that made a big difference. So one of the things I do in my book is I try and follow through personal stories and individual case studies. And you mentioned that area of southern Poland where Schwamberger, the, the SS man yeah. that you had written about, was active. 
Um, I looked at a case study of perpetrators as well as victims in the Mialets area. Mm -hmm. and Which is very nearby, of, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in fact, Schramberger was briefly commandant of the Mialets SS camp there the, it, it, when it was turned into a concentration camp briefly. Um, and one of the perpetrators stayed in the GDR, a guy by the name of Rudy Zimmerman. His two bosses, the people who'd given him the orders to shoot Jews into a grave that they'd had to dig for themselves, the two people who'd given him orders fled to West Germany. One of mm. them in West Germany was never brought to court at all. The other one was brought to court, and there's a fairly shockingly... Um, exoneratory sentence handed out in the Freiburg court. But Rudy Zimmermann, the underling who was given the orders, was put on trial in East Germany and he was sentenced to life imprisonment and indeed spent the rest of his life in an East German prison. Now when you look at the children of perpetrators from that area, Rudy Zimmermann's son, who was seven at the time of his father's arrest, never knew that his father had actually committed actual Nazi crimes, never knew that this, what he'd been sentenced for was true, because his mother told the family, told the children, that, that her husband, their father, was simply a victim of GDR injustice, Stasi mm. injustice. So they grew up believing they were victims of the GDR, rather than mm. children of a Nazi perpetrator. Very, very interesting twist. If you look then at the son of one of the perpetrators from that area, not not the two who were um, Zimmerman's uh, bosses, but another perpetrator, an SS man from that area, if you look at what he was worried about, it was a very typical, and he gave an oral history interview um, in the 1990s, it was a very typical West German story of he worried about what his father might have known. What did mm. he know? Not what had he done? And this hang up about West in West Germany, among many, many West Germans, we never knew anything about it. This false claim, this myth of being an innocent bystander meant that the children were more worried about did their parents know something rather than what did their parents actually do? And it's very, very difficult, I think, for that second generation in communities where there were so many perpetrators, for the second generation to face up to the fact that their father generally a father, might actually have been somebody who was involved in murder, in Nazi criminality. Someone who they love, who they respect, who they want to go on respecting, is in fact somebody who they should feel a degree of revulsion towards that person, what that person had done. Well, that, I mean, that, that, that... So it's a very, very complex story. Yeah. And I think in part, what I found surprising was the fact of growing up in a communist state with an official myth kind of made it easier for the second generation. There was less for them to have to grapple with in a way than there was in West Germany. And yet it's in the East, of course, where all the killing camps were located. It's in the East where um, perpetrators, and you talk about this in your book, the different levels of perpetrators. I mean, we think about Eichmann and of course Hitler, and the generals and and the Eidsatz group and the SS officers who actually did the killing, but perpetrators existed on many levels, and without their participation, you know the 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 extermination couldn't have taken place. The crimes, you know, at all levels, uh, not just the killing, but the taking away of rights, the sl the slave labor camps, all the varying things that happened couldn't have happened without multiple levels of perpetrators. Uh, and it's, it's, it's in the East where so much of that actually took place, Poles moving into the homes of Jews who had been sent off to the killing camp. So, I mean, it's fascinating how from generation to generation that can be shaped by uh, the way memory and history are shaped at the state level uh, and all the way down to the very personal level, you know, the, 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 how the mothers shaped those stories for, for their children, for their grandchildren. Yeah, I think, I think what you say has um, implications right across West and East. If you think about how Nazism was possible and then how it was not come to terms with after the war, if we take West Germany again, there are a lot of industrialists who made their profits on the backs of slave labor, who made massive profits. 
and who then got away with it, who were not brought to court, who never paid a cent of compensation, um, who really wouldn't even recognise the demands of former forced and slave labourers for as long as they could possibly resist this. And there were many, many people involved in government, the bureaucracy, the administration of the Third Reich, who similarly totally evaded ever being brought to account in court. So people who had administered the occupied territories, people who had made profits within the different areas, not just in occupied territories, but within the Reich itself, who were simply not brought to account after the war. And I think that is a huge story in itself that is completely left out of account when you look at the immediate killers, even if we turn just to those who were immediately involved in physical brutality, 99% of people who were involved in killing Jews were never brought to court. Yeah. There are a far larger number of people who were involved in the apparatus of mass murder than were ever brought to court. So this is an impossible thing to deal with in a legal way. Well, and and you're calling you're speaking to me now from Berlin and and I want to get to the issue of uh, memorials, because I think that's an important way that uh, West Germany has distinguished itself, really, um, from from other parts of Europe. Uh, but be, but but before we get to the memorials uh, and by the way, the word memorial has essentially the word memory in it. And that's always it's always been something fascinating to me about this, the connection between memory and history and the shaping of history and present understanding of that history. You mentioned in, in terms of the, the legal handling of the crimes that were committed and the lack of justice in terms of non-prosecuting so many who were uh, responsible and the acquittal of some who were brought to trial and the short sentences that were given even in many of the cases where somebody was brought to trial. But there's also the issue that, that I always found so fascinating, which is that uh, in the 50s in, in West Germany, there was this push to amnesty. Yeah. Uh, ev even for those who were convicted and were serving sentences or those who were precluded from working again at, at, as, Germ as West Germany was being built, you know, former Nazis were not allowed to serve as teachers in schools for a period of time. And then there was this big push to amnesty, uh, which I always found so so important because, again, you know, language matters. And, and amnesty is very closely tied to the word amnesia, which, of course, is a non-remembering uh, or a forgetting of something terrible that happened in the past, some trauma that happened in the past. So... How do you reckon, uh, you know, the, the whole connection between the the failures, uh, even if it's even if we call it an impossibility given the scope, but the, still the failures in terms of the coming to terms legally uh, with the idea of memory and the shaping of memory? Yeah, this is a very, very interesting and quite complex question. The vast majority of trials took place in the first few years after the war, and not only the big trials that we all know about, the Nuremberg and successor trials, but lots of little trials in the Third Reich successor states as well. And I think in those first few years, nobody could actually forget what had happened and mm -hmm. not be involved with it, even though many people in court professed to not remember who actually did what to whom and therefore, you know, <laughs> tried to contribute to acquittals. So failures of memory in a very specific sense, but not in the wider sense. It was very, very present in people's minds. But then you get the Cold War rapidly displacing concern with dealing with the Nazi past. And the Western allies themselves start being more interested in the fight against communism than dealing mm -hmm. with Nazism. And this plays in very well with West Germany under its first chancellor, Konrad Adenauer. Yes. So this period of amnesties and shortening sentences and people who had been sentenced to quite severe sentences in the late 19. 40s being released after maybe three or four years. Um, it, it, quite shocking. So 1950-51 is a big turning point here. 
And at the same time, there is this law in West Germany which um, gives all former Nazi civil servants either their former jobs back or the right to a full pension, including time for service to the Third Reich. Mm. And in fact, there is a re-Nazification of many West yes. German professions in the course of the 1950s, including the legal profession and continuities in the police. So if you think about who is judging and who is pursuing criminals, it's a lot of former Nazis who are very lenient towards their brethren from a few years before. Um, so I think this this is very important at a personal level in terms of um, former Nazis just getting back on the career ladder and, and going on to shape politics and policies and the social environment. Very, very important in that sense. It's also, from your legal perspective, very important because there are political choices about the use of criminal law that then have an impact on what subsequent generations of lawyers can and can't do. Uh, people who were very um, very much opposed to Nazism, very much determined to prosecute, being actually limited by choices that had been made by their predecessors in terms of the criminal law with its very narrow definition of murder as an yes. individually motivated crime in the West, um, which means a narrowing of what it means to be a perpetrator. And that led to some horrific, in my view, miscarriages of justice. Uh, if we take just one of the extermination camps, you were talking about how much of this went on in the east, the extermination camps mm -hmm. on the soil of what is now Poland, the Einsatzgruppen in uh, further east in the Soviet Union at the time. Um, if we take Belgets, one of the dedicated extermination camps, it had no purpose other than killing and there were only two known survivors, one of whom got assassinated when he was deposing his evidence a year after the end of the war. Mm. When the people who were um, SS guards there were put on trial in 1963, seven of the eight were acquitted oh. because although they'd been responsible, demonstrably responsible for shoving nearly half a million people into the gas chambers, uh, there was no evidence about their state of mind, whether they were individually motivated or had committed brutal ex excess violence as the criminal law definition of murder would have required them to. So only one of them was actually found guilty in was that a 1965. Was that a trial um, in West Germany or was that a that trial? That was a trial in West Germany. That was uh -huh. a trial in West Germany. Yeah. And um, it, it's utterly shocking because that, that decision was not for want of trying by the prosecutors, but it was because there'd been this decision to use existing criminal law with its very narrow definition of murder, which was totally uh, inapplicable to a mass murder machine. And it's really only with the Demianyuk trial um, 2009 to 2011, that the legal practice in West German courts changed to say it was sufficient to show that if you were part of the functioning of a place whose task was death, then you were in some sense an accessory to murder. Um, so, you know, these things are not just about who was amnestied, who was acquitted, who was um, allowed to rehabilitate themselves in the 50s. These things go on having implications for decades afterwards. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the issue of memorials, because, again, you're you're in Berlin yeah, yeah, today. I, yeah. And, and yeah. that is really such a fascinating part of this that brings us closer to the present time. Um, in West Germany, because they do go through these phases um, and and uh, influenced not only by what happened within a family or within a country, but what was happening all throughout Europe. And as you point out, the the rise of the the, uh, you know, the Cold War becoming uh, such such a, a dominant force in 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 the way nation states in our own country, in the U.S. and in, and in England. Uh, had to focus on uh, uh, what to do about the Holocaust and those who were involved in it. Um, but but yet in West Germany in particular, there has been in, in very recent years uh, a push to uh, erect memorials to uh, 
uh, the victims of the Holocaust in a way uh, that is really extraordinary. Uh, and 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 uh, well, I'll let you say it because I, I, I think yeah. you know it a lot better it's, than I do. But that's I think that's yeah. a really important part of the present story. It is. It's a very important part of the present story, and it has a long past history. I mean, if you look at the the earliest memorials, um, the push to memorialization was really um, driven by those who had lost relatives, who had lost comrades, who had lost people who they cared for, and they wanted to put a marker on the spot of what was effectively, in a way, sacred ground to remember those who had died there. Um, this, this we're talking about the 50s and 60s, and it was against incredible opposition. Very often, uh, authorities just wanted to pragmatically reuse particular areas. There was a shortage of building materials. There was a shortage of this, that, and the other, and so on. But there was also a pushback against wanting to have any memory of this blotting the landscape, literally right. as well as metaphorically, right. of a subsequent society. So I think the West German story is one very much of contested memorialization, particularly as you look through the 60s, 70s, 80s. Some of the memorial sites were pushed through against fierce local opposition, and some of the victims only became memorialized extremely late. If you think about gay men who were victims of Nazi persecution, um, homosexuality was still outlawed. It was still a criminal offence until the late 1960s. And even as late as the late 1980s, a lot of sites did not want any memorial to gay men mm. alongside memorials to other groups of victims. So it was very hard won pushing by victims, by and large, for a long well, period of time. But well, I think the it's... crucial change has come since the 1980s and 90s, where the second generation, particularly in West Germany, this guilt-ridden generation, has been determined to memorialize. And in Berlin, where, as you say, I am at the moment, um, it's an extraordinary landscape of memorialization, the huge memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe right across the center of Berlin, next to the Reichstag, next to the Brandenburg Gate, the Tiergarten, next to where Hitler's bunker had been. You know, this is an enormous landscape to commemorate those who suffered, those who died, and memorials to other groups of victims, gay men, Sinti and Roma, victims of euthanasia. Um, again, euthanasia is another interesting one. Many of the medical profession, the personnel who had been involved in killing the mentally and physically disabled in the so-called misnamed euthanasia program, yeah. went on in their jobs after the war, went on in the same clinics and sanatoria and hospitals where they'd been killing people just a few years previously. Incredible. And they're not likely to put up a plaque outside their office door <laughs> saying, on this spot a few years ago, I murdered 10,000 people. You know, so right. it was, um, so again, that was a very, very late addition to the memorial landscape, starting again in the 1980s, and really now um, reaching in many of the former centers of the euthanasia killing program, some very good memorial exhibits and attempts at bringing their plight to the attention of the wider public. So it is a huge and interesting memorial landscape in the West. I think it does contrast massively with Eastern Europe. Um, more than half the victims, the Jewish victims of the Holocaust, died outside the extermination camps, not in the gas chambers. And mm -hmm. if you travel across some of the killing sites of Eastern Europe, I've just spent some time in the summer in Lithuania and Latvia, it's very, very striking how limited the memorialization is and how poorly visited even key historical sites are. Um, virtually nobody is bushwhacking through the forests and the trees and, and dealing with the, you know, the brambles and the undergrowth to get to the memorials in Rumbla or Bikanirki around Riga or the pits in Panari mm -hmm. near Vilnius it, or even Liepaja, the beach, you know, where there are well-known sites of horrific massacres, vast numbers of victims, and these do not attract the attention of, of some of the better-known sites. I think one of the points I tried to make in my book, actually, is that our focus on Auschwitz, right though mm -hmm. that is, is in some senses problematic because it does 
in part feed into the myth that this was a small number of people carrying out ghastly things in a secret place, um, rather than what is the reality, the historical reality, that vast numbers of people were involved in the machinery of mass murder across an enormous area of territory. And there are sites of death and suffering right across Europe, which haven't attracted that concentrated memorial attention. So that that's one issue I think it's worth us thinking about. Another issue which bothers me somewhat, and, and I discussed a bit in the book, but you know, I haven't resolved it, is how do you... Um, combine the very real desire to have a site where you can remember victims with respect and yet not at the same time evoke almost unbearable sympathy for their suffering without actually knowing who was responsible, without actually being able to lay the finger of blame at somebody who did it. How do you combine representing the not merely individual perpetrators, individual camp guards and so on, but the whole system that allowed this to take place. How can you combine that with the remembrance of victims? And I think that's a very, very difficult one, which memorial sites haven't adequately resolved. Yeah, and I, I, I want to add to that. I, I want to I want to ask you why 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 do you think all of this has changed so dramatically in recent years? But but to to get to that to add to what you've said. Earlier, you talked about shame. And I mean, shame functions on an individual level and in individual relationships, of course, uh, and on a population wide level, on a state wide level, on a continent wide level, in, in this case, really. Um, and the, 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 the whole question of how, uh, how a people, how a country, how, a, 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 how Europe, how all of us have struggled to remember and what it is we're remembering. Uh, I mean, it's also, I think, worth noting that uh, I was in Berlin in 1989, 1990. Uh, the Berlin Wall came down, and that became an important symbol of memory and remembering. I I, I remember when, when I was there in the late 80s, um, and I, I, I don't recall the name of it, you probably will, but the, but the cathedral or the big church in the center of Berlin that was still standing, burned out and bombed out a shell of what it had once been, that stood as a mm -hmm. physical uh, memorial of sorts to really to the suffering that the German people experienced during World War II, not not as a, a, a tribute or memorial to, to Nazism or to, to the Holocaust, but to the suffering of the German people. Um, th those types of, of memorials existed for, uh, for decades in, in Berlin and in, in other parts of Germany, Dresden, for example. But it, but it took so much time uh, to, to have the types of memorials that, that are present in, in Berlin today. Why? Why do you think that has happened much more so as it has happened in West Germany? And why do you think it has been so difficult uh, to, to come to the same place of remembering, of memorializing uh, in other parts of Europe, in particular in Eastern Europe, as you explained? Yeah, I think there are a lot of tensions even in the West German story. Um, you were mentioning, I, I assume what you were talking about was the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche near yes. the um, the centre of West Berlin, the end of the Kurfürstendamm, Kudam, the main shopping street. Um, the the tension there has always been in West Germany that they wanted to remember their own suffering in the air raids, the bombing and so on. For East Germans, Dresden was quite an easy one because the communist regime could portray it as Allied bombing in the Cold War period. Yeah. So to remember the Allied bombing of Dresden could feed into a sort of anti-Western myth um, on the part of the communist regime, and, and that made it slightly easier. But there has always been this tension for Germans. How do they grieve their own war dead? How do they grieve their own suffering, being expelled, the expulsions, the flight from former German territories in Eastern Europe and so on, and yet at the same time acknowledge their own guilt or complicity or 
participation through passivity and conformity in that Nazi past, it's an almost insoluble conundrum for that generation. I think it is a younger generation and particularly people who are determined to make the mark that this should never happen again. I think there's something really interesting about contemporary Germany, this heightened sense of moral responsibility for your actions in the world that I think is more palpable in Germany than elsewhere. It's by no means universal, unfortunately. We've got the, um, as you know, the rise of right-wing populism, the alternative for Germany party, the AfD, uh, at the moment uh, looming very large, even in the German parliament, um, and particularly in some of the regions of the former East. Uh, so it, it's not a, by any means a simple story. It's a contested one, but I think there is a very strong drive in certain quarters and has been for in the last 30 years or so among younger and now middle-aged Germans, West Germans, to, to push for remembering the past against considerable opposition in right-wing quarters and against the serious dislike of many people who who kept saying we've had enough of it we don't want this shame rammed down our throats anymore and and so on so it's, it's actually a very complex story i think it's complicated in various eastern european states by the um overlay of the experience of communism and in some cases by the attempt to portray collaboration with the Nazis as part of the then fight against communism rather than as an excess of anti-Semitism as well. Um, so it's a very, very complex story, whichever way you look at it, which well, in some it, respects makes the achievements of those who pushed for memorialization in the Federal Republic of Germany all the more impressive, but it is by no means um, an easy achievement or, nor a complete one. Absolutely. And, and we see these strains in American culture uh, today as well. I mean, Jews are still the number one target of hate crimes in the United States, and those numbers are increasing. Uh, we saw violence in uh, the, the town of Charlottesville, Virginia, a couple of years ago, in some respects triggered by a, a move by some to push for the tearing down of statues and memorials to leaders of the Confederacy during the American Civil War uh, and the violence in Charlottesville being so dominated by anti-Semitic and uh, anti-Jewish sloganing. Um, and yet, on the other hand, uh, at my daughter's school here outside of Philadelphia, the sophomore class, uh, each sophomore class uh, takes a field trip to Washington to go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, Jews and non-Jews who visit Israel today, uh, it's almost an essential part of that trip that you go to Yad Vashem. Uh, yeah. So, so we're, we're so we're, th there are these tensions uh, in in an American society too. The struggle to um, uh, come to terms with that history and how we remember and what we're remembering. I mean, there is this teacher in Florida I mentioned at the at the start of our conversation who. Uh, you know, made headlines because he believes that Holocaust denial is a legitimate historical theory. So where, I mean, where do you see t today all of these struggles in the, in, in, in the legal sphere, in the courtrooms, uh, in the legislatures, in fa individual families? Uh, where do you see these struggles bringing us today in terms of the, 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 the process of coming to terms with the meaning of the crimes of the Holocaust? Uh, that is an enormous and very complex <laughs> issue. That's um, true. That's true. Yeah, I think it, it, what is depressing to me about today is the rise of a right-wing populism that it thinks it's okay to talk about race, um, that thinks it's okay to talk about white racism or ethno-racism or national identity being defined in terms of colour and race, I find that deeply problematic, unbelievably, almost unbearably so. Um, the thinking in terms of categories rather than in terms of individual human beings and human rights, I find really, really problematic. 
In terms of the continuing, unfortunately, continuing relevance of our understanding of the Holocaust as history, I think what we can best do as scholars is to um, assist in the development of ways of thinking about how it became possible, what social processes, what kinds of organizational administrative arrangements, what kind of political conditions made certain things possible and prevented other possible histories, possible developments taking place. If we can assist in that kind of process of more differentiated thinking, I think that would be one thing that would be incredibly helpful. Um, and from my own research, I think one of the most important things is being able to rely on a state that upholds the rule of law and a police mm. force that uphold the rule of law rather than, as in Nazi Germany, police who are prepared first just to step back and not intervene when they see Jews being beaten up or arrested, and police who then prepare to be mobilized and participate in the processes of deportations and killings. You know, that kind of process... Um, it really gives pause for thought and we need to think very, very hard about those wider organisational issues, I think, as well as about individual attitudes and responsibilities. Well, and I think that, again, br brings us back to the title of your book, Reckonings, because it, it, I, I've always believed, and I think your research and, and this book, which which I enjoyed enormously and think is so important for, for everyone and perhaps especially young people today, to to realize that this isn't just a historical uh, discussion we're having. This is a this is a, a this is a relevant discussion to so many uh, strains of uh, of our developments in our culture and our politics and our legal system today. Uh, but it, to reckon with what happened uh, during the Holocaust during World War II in Europe is is very much. Uh, relevant and so crucial to understand uh, whether you are uh, in Europe, whether you're in, uh, in in your home country in the UK or in, in the United States. So um, I want to thank you again, Mary. Reckonings is the book, Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice. Uh, we will put a link to the book so people can easily get a copy of the book and, and heartily recommend uh, you read this book. Uh, by Mary Fulbrook, uh, professor of German history at University College in London. And uh, I know, know, too, you have served as the chair of modern history uh, for the British Academy and chair of the German Historical Society. So, uh, and, an, and an exquisitely researched and, uh, and, and really so thoughtfully and beautifully written book as well. So uh, for all that, thank you so much, uh, Mary, and appreciate your time being on the podcast today. Thank you.